We're going we're gonna to sing a song tonight. It's, he knows my name. He knows your name. You know, um, most newborns, their first words are dada, and um, I like that. I'm not, not opposed to that. We're okay with that. You know, but it seems like the older they get, the more they call you dad, dad, dad. It's almost at first you love calling your name, but then, you know, at, at times, and I hate saying this as a parent, but it can be as an inconvenience when you're in the middle of something. You know, they deserve your attention, but there's sometimes you're just like, okay, I just, I need some time, okay? Just give me some time, leave me alone. And I say all that to say this. Aren't you glad God never is inconvenienced by the prayers of his children? He never, never gets frustrated, never just wishes we'd just leave him alone. Uh, actually, he, he wishes we'd call more often. Well, anyways, let's pray. Let's do it right now. Father, we are so grateful that you do know our name, Lord God. Help us to, to be more familiar with coming into your presence, dear God. So, God, I just thank you for... Uh, just this opening song for this, uh, for this evening service tonight, dear Father God. And, and as you know our name, you also know our need. And dear God, you know the needs of the individuals that are here tonight, dear Father God. God, even this one standing right here praying, dear God. You know our needs. God, you know our hearts, Father God. And I'll just praise you 
right now for ministering to us, Lord God, through this service tonight, dear God. May the, uh, may the remainder of this service, dear God, these next few songs that we sing and, and the message, may it really resonate with our heart tonight. Draw us closer to you, and we know that is, is possible when we exalt Jesus. So help us to do that, and we'll just praise you for how you'll bless the remaining, uh, the remaining service. We just pray this believing because we ask it in Jesus' name. And if you can agree with the prayer, help me say amen. Amen. Appreciate it. Would you please take your seats? A few things to um, remind you of we talked about this morning, and, and that is um, you know, I neglected to do this Friday night after the movie or even before it. It was on my mind, but just there's, you know, um, out of uh, um, when you step up here without notes and you don't have it written down, you're probably going to forget something. So I forgot to do it then, I forgot to do it this morning, uh, but I wanted to thank our, our social committee for what the, uh, the job they did Friday night, getting those, the refreshments, everything ready. Yeah, help me please thank them. And brother, I don't see Brother Farrell here tonight, so um, would y'all pass it on to him, Miss Crystal. Let him know appreciative of that. Um, also, this Wednesday night, we'll have our nominating committee meeting. We will meet up in the front office area after the Wednesday night service. Um, prayer, we got a prayer breakfast coming up on August the 8th. It's a Saturday morning, 830. And now this is for... Now, this is for, number one, everybody who's on our prayer partners team. And if you don't know what that is, uh, maybe you, uh, uh, this is your invitation to come to the breakfast. Because what it is, we have a prayer partners uh, uh, teams. And they meet two, by, uh, two at a time on a Sunday morning in, in a prayer room right down uh, from the sanctuary here. And they pray all the way through our services. So if you uh, uh, seem interested in that and would like to get, uh, get some more information, uh, we invite you to come to that prayer breakfast on August the 8th at 8.30 here in our fellowship hall, and there's, there's really no, no obligation to follow through with being a part of it. You know, if you come and, and maybe it's not what, um, uh, uh, maybe it's not something you are interested in after you hear about it, at least just come and benefit from the breakfast. We all need breakfast, amen? So you can come for that. Um, also coming up in August, on August the 9th, the Sunday evening, we'll have Gary Shepard in concert at our evening service. He's a former tenor singer for the Kingsman Quartet. Um, August the 15th, uh, or so Saturday from 10 to 2, we're going to have a back-to-school bash. What's going to encompass all of the children's department, that's youth and children. And on the 27th of August, there is a key leader workshop. And we're going to uh, get a sign-up sheet for that. And, and, and so, and it's also some information sheets you can read. They're out there on the table where you can see what all um, kind of breakout sessions and, and courses are going to be offered on that. So uh, please, we encourage you to look at that. And also, last but not least... Uh, August the 31st is the last uh, Sunday, the month of August, and we will have our fifth Sunday night sing. So we'll also work on getting a sign-up sheet back there in the foyer for that, for you to sign up with that. All right, before we stand and have a moment of fellowship, I want to ask, uh, do we have any guests here with us tonight? I see a lot of the familiar faces. I don't see anybody that's visiting for the first time, but do we have anybody visiting for the first time? All right, with the rest of us stand, and let's have a moment of fellowship tonight.
we'll return to our seats to sing Pentecostal power. Lord, as of old at Pentecost, Thou didst Thy power display with cleansing, purifying flame. Descend on us today, Lord. Send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, Thy floodgates of blessing. Sing leaning on the everlasting arm. and secure brother boy that's that means a lot nowadays I'm telling you and I, I'm so thankful 
to know a, a great God. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you uh, just for a great day in this place. Father, a wonderful day, a day where we've come together and heard your word and, and leaned on you and leaned on one another. Father, that's what it's all about. We worship you and we, we help one another. Father, just uh, continue to grow in our lives. That's our prayer. In this place of worship, Father, that you've blessed and, and uh, we pray for it to continue for many, many, many years. Father, as we come to this time where we take up the offering, an act of worship, Father, may it be blessed uh, for your good in this community and in our lives, Father. Teach us to give back. We love you. We thank you. We worship your name in the power and in the power and presence of Jesus Christ in our lives. We thank you and love you. Amen. stop sometime. We enjoyed it while they played. Amen. Sounded good. Amen. Goodbye world, goodbye. Goodbye world. We're going to wave goodbye one of these days. You know, uh, yesterday I had, uh, had the opportunity to go down to a place called, um, was well, just a little river, Bob's River Place or something like that down there, uh, <coughs> excuse me, just south of Lake City. They got a lot of ropes you can swing out on and one of them, you know, um, I'm not exaggerating, it probably launches you about 30 or 40 feet in the air. You know, so I, I jumped off of it, and you know, lo and behold, I came back down. But one of these days, one of these days, we are going to defeat the law of gravity, and we're going to get snatched up, and we're not coming back down. Amen. At least for another, at least for about seven years, and we're going to come back down for the millennial reign. But then, man, it's going to get good. That's a whole other sermon right there, and we'll, we'll talk about that sometime. But I want to instruct you tonight to take a copy of God's Word and find the book of Colossians. We began that study here a couple months ago, so we are studying Colossians on Sunday evening, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We are still in chapter number 1, but tonight we're going to begin in verse number 21, Colossians chapter uh, number 1. 
beginning of verse 21, if you can physically stand, please stand with me tonight in honor and reverence to the reading of the inspired, infallible, inerrant word of the living God. I'm speaking on this subject tonight, to be continued, to be continued, and it's actually taken pretty much right out of the text, and you'll see that once we get to verse 23, so keep that in mind, our subject is to be continued. In verse 21, the Bible says there, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Father God, thank you for your word. I pray you'd capture our attention, and may you have all of our affection. Dear God, I just thank you so very much for speaking into our lives tonight, and may you do it for Jesus' sake. We pray this believing because we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. You may be seated. Uh, uh, many of you have just heard that, uh, uh, that Miss Janice and Brother Kirby, they just got back in town. They had a wonderful trip, from what I understand. You know, as the story goes, I, I, can I tell this? Appreciate it. As the story goes, uh, as the story goes, they was heading, you know, north into, they got one of them old Georgia towns, and they pulled over for gas. And what you, ha- what you have to know is, is that Miss Janice, she does all the driving because she can't hear that good, but she can see really well. And Brother Kirby, he can't see, but he can hear really well. So when they got to that, that old Georgia town, this gas station was still full service. And so, uh, he, so Kirby gets out of the car and goes to talk to the attendant. Miss Jan is still at the steering wheel. She can't hear that well. So the attendant, you know, they, he says, well, will, I, will, I do, will it be for you? And Kirby said, fill her up. Janice says, what did he say? And Kirby said, well, he asked how much gas. I said, fill her up. So the guy, the, the attendant asked Brother Kirby, he said, where are you headed to? They were headed to the mountains. Janice said, what did he say? Kirby said, well, he asked where we're going. I said, we're headed to the mountains. And so the gas attendant asked Miss, uh, uh, Brother Kirby, he said, uh, where are y'all from? He said, oh, we're from uh, Fernandina Beach, Florida. Miss Janice said, what did he say? And Kirby said, well, he just asked where we're from, and I said, from Fernandina Beach, Florida. And the gas attendant said, Fernandina Beach, Florida? He said, I, I know a woman there that is the meanest, rudest, obnoxious woman I've ever met in my life. Janice said, what did he say? Kirby said, he knows your sister. And that story is to be continued. Is that right? <laughs> you know, uh, the phrase to be continued, it is used in like uh, TV miniseries. It's used in movies when, a, uh, uh, when another movie is projected or when a sequel is projected to come out. They'll always leave it with the tag phrase to be continued. Paul, in his message, in his letter to the church at Colossae, is teaching uh, them and consequently us now that the Christian life is one that is to be continued. I'm going to say it one more time. The Christian life, uh, 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 um, under the teaching of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, Paul, he wrote to them, which is still relevant for us tonight, is that the Christian life is not a one-and-done type prayer where I can walk down an aisle, meet the pastor, get dunked, say a prayer, and sign my name, and then live like hell the rest of my life. That is not a picture of of true biblical, biblical Christianity. Christianity, according to the definition by the Word of God, is that uh, once a person experiences conversion in Jesus Christ, they never find themselves walking away from the church or walking away from God, but they continue on on a journey with Jesus. Listen to this narrative that God the Holy Spirit gives concerning the early church. We find this in Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. And the Holy Spirit says they're concerning the early church. And they, speaking of the church, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So do you see, you, you pick the word continue that was used twice there. You know, so what we see in the early church is that we didn't see people just flocking to the apostles who made a profession of faith. Um, 
we don't see a group of people who just said the sinner's prayer and then just walked back into Judaism and lived like a Jew. No, they were some, excuse me, they were saved out of something. They were saved out of Judaism. They were saved out of the paganism, whatever the surrounding city they were from. They, there was a continuation. You see, they just didn't pray and walk away. The Bible says, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, uh, the, the, Spirit, the Spirit of God speaking here, at the early church, they continued with the apostles. They continued to break bread together. They continued to study the Word of God, to de- uh, the Word of God together. So there was, uh, we see community there. We see a body of believers, not just people just want to join a, uh, 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 want to join a, a societal club, not somebody just want to be a, quote, member just for the rights of voting at business meetings. No, they were wanting to become a disciple. They were wanting to become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me just state, go ahead and state clearly for the record what I believe. What I believe to be a birthmark of a believer. I believe that a true disciple of Jesus Christ is one that is continuing to abide in Jesus Christ. That's just my deep-rooted conviction that a true believer, a true disciple of Jesus Christ, is one that has continued to abide in their relationship with Jesus Christ. So with that being said, no, I do not have any spiritual gifts of discernment where I can look out here and say, okay, everybody that came back tonight, you're all saved. But everybody who did not continue and everybody who did not come back tonight, they ain't saved. Okay, I can't, I don't, I can't say that. I can never make a statement. You know, I can never uh, um, assess a person's relationship with the Lord. You know, I don't have that spiritual gift. And by the way, nor do any of you. You okay with that? None of us, God don't give any of us that discernment you know, to be a fruit inspector, to see, if there's, uh, to see if there's viable Christian fruit in the individual's lives. God has not called us to be a fruit inspector. He has called us to do many things, but to try to examine another person's salvation, God has never called us to do that. So what I'm about to say, I, can, I cannot speak for no one else. I can only speak for myself. And so for myself, I speak when I say this, okay? You like how I preface that? What I'm about to say, I speak for myself. And I don't include everybody. Uh, 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 this, in, uh, 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 this in Christendom, you know, uh, that they should, you know, adopt this. But here's, anyway, here, here's, here's what I've experienced. That when I got saved, March 1995, for 20 years, over two decades now, when I got, since I got saved, nobody has ever had to call and beg me to come to Sunday school. I call God as my witness. Listen, when, since I got saved, nobody has had to call and beg me to come to Sunday evening church. Nobody's ever had to call and beg me to come to a Wednesday night prayer meeting. And listen, I am not, I am not, I, I believe God has given me perfect liberty to say this. I'm not saying this to embellish myself. I just want to tell you that when I got saved, I think I got saved, okay? Because but prior to that, I did not want to go to church, whether it be Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday, or even for the occasional homecoming with the free food. I just didn't want nothing to do with it. But God changes your want to when you get saved. Like I said, that's just, I'm speaking for myself, but I believe the Bible teaches us that a true disciple of Jesus Christ will abide in Jesus, and there ought to be some consistency, there ought to be a continuity where they continue to pursue Jesus Christ. So, verse 21, verse 21 teaches this, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he hath reconciled. Look at the the two words that Paul uses to describe what we used to be, aliens and enemies. Well, what is an alien? An alien is simply someone who doesn't belong. You know, they could be intruding, they could be trespassing, uh, they, they just don't belong, they're an alien. And an enemy is someone who is unwanted. Okay, so prior to us coming to know Jesus Christ through his free pardon of salvation, through the blood of the cross, we were aliens and we were enemies of the faith. That's a hard pill to swallow, but that's exactly what the Bible teaches us, that prior to our conversion experience, we did not belong and we did not want to belong. Is that right? Would you say that's your, that's your testimony? Did you experience that, that before you come to know Christ, that you didn't belong with a household of faith, and, and, and deep inside of you, you didn't want to belong? That everybody else is okay going to church, doing their thing, 
but you didn't want that. You, was, you, already, you already had busy, you had plans for Sunday, and it did not include coming to church. But all, but all of us who have experienced Christ, you know, that, that those of us who used to do other things on Sunday nights, you know, we, we free up our schedule to make sure we're in the house of God. You know, uh, um, I probably shouldn't say this, but it's on my mind, so I'm going to go ahead and say it. Now, I don't want to name them, though, but, you know, occasionally our kids will say, you know, well, we only get one, one day on the weekend. All we have is Saturday. We've got to go to church on Sunday. You know, they make it sound like it's punishment, you know, <laughs> taking them to church. You know, I, I can think of some se- severe punishments. As a matter of fact, they have had some severe punishments other than church. But nevertheless, it just, it just goes to show you the maturity, and, I can, and if I can use this word, the desire that a person has. I'm not, I'm not doubting my children's salvation, but uh, there, ought to, there ought somewhere along the lines that we ought to have a desire to want to be with God's people. So, we were aliens and enemies of the faith, didn't belong, didn't want to belong. Let me make this statement. Sin is the most destructive force in the universe. Is that right? Think about what sin has, has done. You can talk about the, the atom bombs and the nuclear bombs. It don't compare. None of that compares to what sin does. Think about of all the diseases and all the deaths and all the divorces. Everything that's totally attributed to sin. I know we don't like to say that. We don't like to put that label on it. But bottom line, at the end of the day, hospitals are open because of sin. Uh, lawyers are still uh, um, doing what they do because of sin. And everything, all the depravities of man is because sin is such a destructive force and sin has caused us to be aliens and enemies from God. Now this is a, a rather radical, you know, uh, illustration. But you think about an Islamic terrorist. They are both an alien and an enemy. Is that right? They are unwanted, they don't belong here, and we don't want them here. Do you agree with that? Oh, I hope so. Hey, the Islamic, the Islamic extremists, they don't belong here, and we certainly don't want them here. Uh, 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 but like it or not, we were once an enemy of God. James 4.4 4 teaches this, Adulterers and adulteresses, do not you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So back to the radical illustration of the uh, of this alien and this enemy that, that, that could possibly be wanting to seek uh, asylum or to seek, uh, uh, to seek a, a citizenship in the United States. What, if anything, would ever change how an alien or an enemy is received into the United States? What would change that? Two things. Number one, citizenship. And number two, loyalty to our country. That would change it. That would change it. Maybe not for an Islamic extremist because they want to hear to, to, to annihilate us. But people who are flooding our borders from other countries, they're seeking citizenship. And most of them, you know, I can't say all of them, but they, they want to be loyalty and they want to pledge their allegiance to America. And before they become a citizen, they must do that. They must state and solemnly avow that they would pledge their allegiance to the United States of America. So think about yourself prior to your salvation experience. As the Bible says, we were enemies and aliens from God. What then, uh, what then are the two things that brings us and breaks that, you know, that breaks us uh, from, be, from being an enemy of God? The same things. Citizenship and allegiance to God. Citizenship, we, we become a citizen of heaven when we accept Jesus Christ. And by so, when we accept Jesus Christ, we must also pledge our allegiance to Jesus Christ. Uh, you've heard me say it before, I'll say it again. Christianity is not like a cafeteria line where you just walk down it and pick and choose what you want. You know, we, don't, we, we are not afforded the rights to do that. We cannot just walk down the line and just feel, and just feel uh, kind of remorseful and kind of feel, kind of fear, uh, uh, kind of feel fearful because I don't want to burn in hell forever. And so we say, well, you, g- give me some of that Savior but now that Lord, you can keep that, okay? I want to fill my plate with just Savior. I don't want to go to hell, but I don't want somebody telling me what to do. Christianity is not like that. We don't, get, we don't just pick and choose what we want. As, as the phrase goes, he is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Verse, the verse says in verse 21, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your what? What does it say there? In your mind. In your minds, make, must, make no mistake, friends. Nowhere is mankind more 
alienated from God than in our minds. Go back with me 6,000 years ago to the Garden of Eden. Guess what man did in the Garden of Eden? Satan tempted and allured them. He got into their minds and he robbed them of everything. And you need to hear and know tonight that the enemy, Satan, knows that ever since the fall of man, mankind has always been susceptible to giving in to the temptations and to the battles that Satan wants to form in our minds. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4 says, But even if our gospel is veiled or hid, it is hid to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ with the image of God should shine on them. So prior to us becoming a Christian, Satan tried to keep our mind blinded, and you need to know, and we all need to be reminded, that even though we're not living in darkness as a non-believer, as a lost man or woman, we still need to be reminded that Satan will probably daily, did you hear what I said? He'll probably daily attempt to attack our minds because he knows if he can derail our thought process, he will ruin our day. Verse 22, in the body of his flesh, let me go back to verse 21, because verse 22 flows out of verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he, Jesus, reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Let me just make this statement. Jesus loves us so much that he died on earth so that we might live in his heaven. Is that a good summation of the gospel? He loves us so much that he died here on earth so that we might live in his heaven. For anybody that might be here tonight and you're flirting with a God complex, you think there's a little Messiah living in you, and you think you're, you think you're God, i got a question for you. Sir or ma'am, would you ever lay down your life and die for an Islamic extremist terrorist? That's a good question. Would you ever do that? Would you ever, would you ever lay down and willingly die for a terrorist? Then you ain't God then. <laughs> because guess what, God was, guess what God did? He died for all of his enemies. Is that right? Romans 5.8 says this, But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and it was in that fallen sinful condition as a non-believing, lost person, living in rebellion, never having received Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. It was that person. It was not when we were coming to church and paying our tithes and uh, uh, singing in the choir and teaching Sunday school. No, it was when we were at our worst. It, while we were still sinners, that Jesus died for us. So he died not for all the people who cheered him on, but he died for his enemies. That's who Jesus died for. Died for us. Verse, the verse, verse 22 says this, who, who, gee, He reconciled us in the body of His flesh through death. Notice how, he's going to, he, he, notice how He's going to present us, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. Try to picture this scene unfold in heaven, okay? You've got to put on your sanctified thinking caps uh, to think about this, but try to picture this scene unfold in heaven. There you are in heaven, standing before God, and all of a sudden, the accuser of the brethren walks in. Now, we all know who the accuser of brethren is, right? That's Satan. The accuser of the brethren, he approaches the throne, and certainly he has all kinds of diabolical accusations and, and um, uh, um, uh, just to, uh, uh, everything to attack you. But you know what the bottom line is? The bottom line is, is that the accuser of the brethren, he don't have to lie on any of us. If he just went before God... He could state the truth about my life, and I'd be embarrassed before God. The enemy don't have to, uh, the accuser of the brethren, and he's not, he don't necessarily have to be the false accuser. He can go to God and speak truth about you and speak the fa- actual facts about you, and it would be exactly right. But watch this. Here's how, here's how I can see the scene unfold in heaven. I can see the accuser of the brethren, as Revelation uh, says that the enemy is, and, and, he, uh, and he approaches the throne, and, uh, and he says, look at his filthiness. 
Look at that pastor's life. Look at his thought life. Look at the picture in his mind. And look at the things uh, uh, that so-and-so uh, that they view on TV. Or look at what somebody views online. Look at his filthiness. Look at his faults. Look at that person. They're so totally uh, inconsistent. They're full of flaws. They're full of blemishes. Their life is characterized by doubt and despair. He can say, look at the facts. And he has broken your laws. He's grieved your Holy Spirit. And he has erred from the truth. He could actually do that on any of our lives, and he would be stating the facts. But here's what Jesus does, and I, I'm so glad the Bible paints his picture that I don't believe Jesus, he, he could, but he would never say this. Jesus would never stand and say, well, Lucifer, you got a point. He, 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 or, he, he or she, they're guilty, you're right. No, listen, God will never say that. But you know what God will say? God will say to the enemy, you must be blind because you're not seeing the same thing I'm seeing. When I look at, when I look at any of my children, when God looks at any of his children, he does not see your faults. You know what he sees? He sees that you have been covered with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When he looks at us and all the accusations and, and uh, everything that's being hurled at us, all God sees is the blood of his son. And he says, oh no, he is holy, he is unblameable, and he is unreprovable. Now if that's so, and it is, do you know what the implication of this verse is? The implications of verse 22 is this, that if a person dies apart from knowing Jesus Christ, they'll stand before God unholy, totally blamable, and they'll be utterly and eternally reprovable with no chance of parole. Never, never will they have an opportunity to make it right. Never. That's why I say, on this side of eternity, we need to make it right with Jesus. Eternity is too long to get it wrong. We must make it right before it's too late. Well, verse 23. Look at verse 23. It, it, he starts off with what seems to be a conditional word, if. He says, if you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, and made a minister. Now the word if there, it's not the first time that, he, that, it, that Paul uses that in the New Testament in his letters. But this word if, it is used in various times. It is always determined by the mood of the verbs that it is associated with. So here the word if, it can be rendered if so be. And so it is also followed by an indicative mood. In other words, Paul is saying this, there is no doubt about it. Okay, Paul is not casting doubt about one's salvation, but he's saying this, with absolute certainty that a person who is genuinely saved, they indeed will continue in the faith. So it's not a question of if you do this or that, you're saved. No, it's more of a statement that you will continue on because you are saved. Because you understand what it's showing us in this verse it, it, because it's not showing us that our salvation is incumbent upon us con uh, uh, to produce good works. Because you must understand, if you get off into that, uh, that ideology, and if you get off into believing that, that you must maintain good works to keep your salvation, then, then we must conclude that if we stop producing good works and start going back to our old mannerisms and our old way of life, that we can lose our salvation. And I don't know about you, but I believe the Bible teaches that once you are saved, you're saved, you are signed, it is settled, you are secure. I believe Jesus has never, he has never demolitioned a mansion. He is built in heaven because one person did something to lose their salvation. Once you're saved, I believe the mansion goes up, the name's written down, and God is never erased somebody's name from the land's book of life who has genuinely and authentically trusted Jesus for salvation. If, and if you don't believe that, you got the right to be wrong, okay? We give you that liberty here. So he says, he goes on to say, if you continue the faith grounded and settled, two words there, grounded and settled. Uh, um, I mean, the grounded speaks of the foundation and settled speaks of... Uh, of a firm stance. So the Apostle Paul is not only talking about taking a firm stand on the rock, but we are to settle down on the rock. We are to anchor in and settle down on the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. 
So the uh, discipline and determination are key components in the Christian life. I kind of alluded to that prior to a statement by, made by one of our children of, well, I only get one day a week. I only get w- uh, one day on the weekend. i got to go to church on Sunday. Discipline and determination are key components in the Christian life. Listen, we're not, we're not saved out of our discipline. See, a, di- a disciplined life is one who gets up every day, spends time with God. They're disciplined with their finances. They're disciplined with their time. Listen, we're not saved by discipline, but discipline flows out of our salvation experience. Discipline and determination. Determination will take us a long way of becoming the, the, of becoming the, the, uh, the Christian that God wants us to be and the one that we want to be. You've heard my heart before. I've stated many times that, you know, I do not want to settle for mediocrity. You know, that's just not me. You know, I don't want to settle for just the, the status quo. I don't want to settle for just, you know, just doing enough to get by. And I just try to pound that philosophy into my children's minds of, 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 of applying themselves to the schoolwork. Listen, you can't come back and do this once you graduate. Do your best now. Uh, don't just do enough just to get by. Do your very best. And these are things that, just, that God instilled in me. And, and I can't help but say this, but God has brought me to a place in my life. I wish I could say for 20 years I've always been here, but I cannot I cannot say that. You know, I, 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 I can think early in my Christian life and even into my, uh, 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 um, uh, I don't know, around uh, 10 years of salvation. So I don't know. But I definitely can remember times of being lazy and not applying myself. Did not have the, the disciplines that have developed over the past few years. But it all flows out of our determination. Is that right? It all flows out of our, out of our determination. I can tell you right here tonight. I can, I can look out here, and I can tell every single one of you how close you are to Jesus. You're as close as you want to be. You're right? I can tell you're, cl- you're as close to your spouse as you want to be. That's why some of you are sitting right here. Some of you like way over here. I'm just kidding. But you know that applies. Some of y'all just scoot it over. Just get, get, get a little closer just then. Hey, I'm here to help your marriage as well, okay? Amen. You can thank me later for that one. That applies to every relationship. We will get out what we want. So discipline and determination, key components, say they're hallmarks of the Christian life. Hallmarks of the Christian life. He goes on to say in verse 23, if you continue in the faith, and remember it's not an if, of, uh, if I don't, I'm going to lose it. No, it's a certainty. Uh, it, 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 it is, it's a guarantee that if we are, it means if so be, the true Christian will continue, uh, will continue in the faith. Uh, what does Philippians 1 6 say? That, uh, that God who began that work in us, He will finish that work. So God knows those that are truly His. It is His responsibility to make sure that we endure until the end. Thank God, I thank God for that. So He says there in verse 23 If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope. The word not moved, that phrase means not continually being shifted away. Like the old river was that yesterday. Tide comes in, tide comes out. All, the level's always going up and down. You know, we've been there as Christians, haven't we? You know, where, you know, uh, our level of devotion, our level of, uh, of passion kind of go up, kind of come down, up and down. But listen, I just want to encourage you to, to uh, develop some disciplines that would, um, that would encourage the process where we continue just to go up and up and up in our relationship with Christ, but not two steps forward, three steps back mentality, but hey, but just to continue to be determined in your Christian life that, listen, it's not about me, never been about me, but it's about Jesus. Less of me, more of him. As John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase. I promise you, I I promise you. I haven't read this anywhere necessarily, but I've experienced it that the less I get of John out the way and get more of Jesus, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day when I get less of John and more of Jesus. 1 John 2.19 says this. Listen to what John says over there in that passage. He says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. True birthmark of a believer 
is that we will continue to follow Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for the inspiration of your word. And God, I pray that you would speak deeply into our hearts. God, I believe you've done that. God, I pray by your Holy Spirit, take these truths that you have taught us tonight and seal them in our heart, dear God. God, forgive us for where we have erred away. Forgive us for where we have uh, allowed the enemy to really wreck our minds. God, I pray you forgive us. Help us to get back on track and to continue on following Jesus. God, I just thank you for how you have blessed this response time. God, I just pray that those hearts that you uh, have spoken to, that they uh, would uh, leave here in total compliance, having obeyed whatever decision you are leading them to make. May you be glorified as our prayer. And we pray it in Jesus' name, believing. Amen. And would you please stand with us tonight as we prepare to sing these hymns of decision. This is response time in the house of the Lord. That means it's decision time. And so, ma'am, uh, there's nothing else I need to say. Uh, God, either God has initiated something here tonight or he has not initiated anything. But if he has, you know, if he has directed some of this your way, I would encourage you, don't just say amen to it, but hey, make application to your life. Take it and apply it to your life. You know what God does? God always puts stuff down here at the bottom so we can reach it. He never puts it way up there where it's out of our reach. God, he puts it right in front of us so that we can receive it. And now with that being said, you know where you are tonight with your relationship with the Lord. If you're not where you should be, I encourage you. Today is the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, Sunday. Hey, don't go any longer without uh, reconciling your relationship with Jesus. And you know what? If you're not even saved tonight, you know, we, we talked tonight about uh, what it looks like to become a Christian. And we talked about the implications in eternity if you continue to reject Christ. And certainly, certainly, sir, ma'am, you do not want that to happen to you. So what must you do then? Pray and say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Christ. <coughs> say yes to what he, hey, he's already said yes to you. He's already made his choice. He's already chose you. The only thing left to do is for you to choose him. Hey, he's already surpassed heaven and hell and the grave. He, he, he surpassed it all. He left heaven. He came to earth. He died. He went to Hades. He went to hell. He led captivity captive. He ascended. He went back to heaven. And now he stands at the door of your heart. And all you must do is say yes and open up your heart. And, the, and Jesus, the Son of God, will step out of heaven and step into your heart. Tonight, he'll do that if you say yes. Would you please bow your heads and hearts? Sir, ma'am, if that's you, you've never been saved, but you know you need to, you want to be saved. Hey, would you pray this prayer of repentance tonight? Place your faith in Jesus. I'm going to lead you this prayer. Pray to, repeat it. Pray it after me. Pray it to God, but make it your own. Are you ready? Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner. I need to be saved, and I want to be saved. Only you, Jesus, can save me. Tonight, I receive you as my Savior, and I receive you as my Lord. And with your strength and your power, I will live for you the rest of my life. I will continue to follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. As we sing, would you come? Sir, man, you just prayed uh, to, to become a Christian. You just had a born-again experience. Would you come? Uh, sir, ma'am, you, you are uh, uh, totally at peace. You have assurance of your salvation experience. Uh, um, uh, but if there are still issues troubling you, uh, would you come? Be totally reconciled to the death of his cross tonight. Don't leave with anything undone. As we sing, would you come?
What a sweet, sweet invitation song. I just wonder how many people have responded to the gospel, and that, that, that song was at the end of it, man. There's a lot of people in the kingdom right now, and people who are headed that way through that inspired song of Just As I Am. So, so scripturally proven and, and tested and true that that is the only way it will ever come to Jesus as just as we are, just as we are. And aren't you glad he accepts us? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I pray you have a great week. Um, may God bless you, and may He use you. May He use you this week. No, He wants to. I know He wants to. But may we uh, be mindful and have a fresh perspective that we don't let, you know, the the darkness of this world, and all the all the news stations and all the media and all that kind of stuff that can drag us down. But may God give us a, a fresh perspective to see where He's at, so that we can join Him. Because God never anticipated for us just to go do our thing and that he'd follow us last time i said he wants to lead us he wants to be he wants to be out in front and that's where he needs to be at amen amen hey god bless you thank you for coming back tonight uh would you reach out to your neighbor and let's sing our song dismissal and after our services you can talk to brother kirby and janice about where they got gas from over the weekend okay we are one in the bond